Welcome to the HKS Energy Policy Seminar. I'm Joe Aldi, happy to host today's session. Glad that we have on Patriots Day and Marathon Monday here in Boston, uh, students and colleagues joining us here in the room and on Zoom. We're thrilled to have with us today for I believe the second talk in the seminar series, but I think maybe the first in person, uh, Wake Smith for his talk, Frosted Tips, an Alternative Rationale for Solar Geoengineering. Wake is a research fellow at the Mostafa Rahmani Center for Business and Government here at HKS. He also serves as a lecturer at the Yale School of the Environment. In 2022, Wake authored his book, Pandora's Toolbox, The Hopes and Hazards of Climate Intervention, published by Cambridge University Press. I think it was a lot of the work done for that book served as the basis for your Zoom seminar in this series in 2021. Wake previously served as chairman and president of PIMCO World Air Services, chief operating officer of Atlas Air Worldwide Holdings, and president of the flight training division of the Boeing Company. Wake holds a BA from Yale and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Wake, welcome back to the Energy Policy Seminar. Thank you, Joe. And it is indeed a privilege to uh, address this group and address this group again. I, when I previously did so in 2021, I remembered recalling fondly people juggling sandwiches on their knees in some room in Harvard. And uh, we weren't doing that then, but we're now doing that today. So uh, uh, some bit of normalcy has returned, which is a blessing. Um, I'm gonna talk today about solar geoengineering and I don't know how much familiarity uh, folks here have with uh, Solar Geo. So I'm going to start with a little Solar Geo 101, uh, but then go into conclusions that derive from two uh, papers that I have. Uh, uh, one will be published in the next week or so. One was submitted in the last week or so. One of my uh, co authors is here with us today on that latter paper. But Solar Geoengineering. Uh, the concept is that um, mitigation may prove to be utter, will prove to be utterly necessary to solve the climate problem. When you find yourself in a hole, the first rule is to stop digging, and that's what we need to do vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, emissions cuts. So none of the following is intended to uh, delay or defer or distract from the need to cut emissions as quickly as we can convince each other to do so. But I am a pathway pessimist, as this first slide uh, implies. I'm afraid we are not going to cut emissions anywhere near fast enough for that to be a sole and sufficient solution to the climate problem that we will confront. So I'm convinced that we will additionally need adaptation. We'll need to build seawalls and buy more air conditioners and so on. Uh, we will need carbon capture in a very substantial way and not simply trees, but big, ugly industrial machines that look alike, like the problems that got us into this in the first place. But I think we're going to need a lot more carbon capture than people realize. But many of us worry that we may also need uh, solar geoengineering. Um, uh, the quip is it's a bad idea whose time may nonetheless come. And I have uh, increasingly uh, believe both sides of that uh, sentence. There are lots of solar geo ideas that one hears about space-based assets and cirrus cloud thinning and painting deserts white and putting tarpaulins on glaciers. All that stuff is stupid. We ain't doing that. There's 1.1 things in the solar geo toolbox that I think are feasible and may make sense. The one is stratospheric aerosol injection, which I'll get to in a moment. But the point one is marine cloud brightening. That's the other tool that might work. I think it's unlikely that it will work, but I'm not dismissive of it. There are lots of serious people that work on marine cloud brightening, and I hope that that might emerge to become a tool. But the tool that I at least have pretty high confidence could be a real tool is st stratospheric aerosol injection. And that's the idea that we could loft millions of tons per year of reflective aerosol particles into the lower stratosphere that would cool the earth by deflecting out one or two of the incoming, one or two percent 
of the incoming sunlight that what might otherwise uh, enter the climate system. The Earth's albedo or reflectivity uh, is about 30%, so 30%-ish of the sunlight that would otherwise uh, enter our climate system bounces off of clouds or bounces off of ice or bounces off of sand and is reflected back into space. And all we would need to do to substantially uh, uh, change the climate, cool the climate, would be to deflect out another one or two percent, raise our albedo from 30 percent to 31 or 32 percent. And that would uh, substantially uh, cool the planet. Um, it is not a magic undo button for climate change. It doesn't solve every problem that climate change would create. It's not a, a cure to the disease. It's morphine, not penicillin. Treats symptoms, doesn't cure the disease. So it doesn't replace the need to decarbonize. But again, if we don't decarbonize as quickly as we need to, um, we will perhaps need to turn to solar geo. Um, but I've developed a new thought as to why we may need to uh, uh, develop solar geo, and uh, that will be the main thing I'll talk about today. In the field of solar geoengineering, my particular niche is the question of how we would actually do it. If we got over the much more difficult questions of should we do it and where should we do it, um, the questions that I focus on are how we would actually do it. The aeronautical question of how we would get the gunk up in the sky, uh, the financial question of how much it would cost. Two of my recent papers have focused on other similar practical aspects of this. Um, the one that will be published this month is on how long it would take to operationalize SAI. So if we all decided we want it and we push the launch button, how soon can we have SAI cooling the planet? The short answer to that question is funded launch plus 20 years. Now, solar geo is often referred to as a break glass in case of emergency um, uh, climate intervention. That's only true if there's a fire extinguisher in the cabinet. If there's no fire extinguisher in the cabinet, breaking the glass got us nowhere, and there is currently no fire extinguisher in the cabinet. Uh, so for reasons I'll explain uh, in greater detail a little farther along, it would take something like 20 years from the time we fund a launch to the time that we would hit whatever cooling target we had established for SAI. We could do stunts much more quickly. There's an, a vendor called Make Sunsets that is doing stunts today. You can buy cooling credits from Make Sunsets in the way that you can buy credits to offset your flight, but those have no impact on the climate. They are merely stunts. Um, and, and there are other more material stunts that, that we could do, but for climate changing SAI, funded launch plus 20 which has been okay, because my prior view, at least, had been we won't need this technology anytime soon. Um, can we share the slides? So again, if we um, continue on a roughly RCP 4.5 pathway, which I think still represents the middle of the road in terms of the emissions pathways that the world might pursue, we will blow through 1.5 C in this decade. Uh, by some metrics, although they're not the right metrics, we already blew through it last year. Um, it, there are some data sets that indicate last year we were 1.5 and a little more above the pre-industrial average that is used for this purpose. The problem with that is you usually me measure this on a decadal or two decade time frame so that you're not chasing uh, data outliers and 2023 probably was a data outlier. Uh, most people think 2024 will be a little less uh, warm, but the punchline is we ain't stopping at 1.5 C. Uh, that just isn't happening. Uh, I think we will cross 2 C by mid century. And it's therefore then, if that proves true, and that's consistent with RCP 4.5, um, it would only be in the second half of this century that we would 
face serious overshoot, we would finally realize we're above 2C and we're not going down. And it's only in the realm of serious overshoot that I can imagine we would utilize SAI to cool the planet in the way that's generally conceived. The, the common use case is we get to 2C or whatever temperature we get to. Uh, when we finally decide, let's commence the SAI, we develop the infrastructure, we implement it. Um, and the, the common justification for this uh, variety of SAI is the napkin diagram, that if we kept uh, emitting without any policy intervention, we'd shoot temperatures, we'd shoot off into the stratosphere. If we cut emissions aggressively, maybe we could level those temperatures out, but that doesn't get them down. Maybe we can get them down with some CO2 removal, but that would still leave a task undone. Which task is this temperature peak here? And so the prior justification for SAI is that's the thing that could bring down that peak. You could commence SAI here and keep temperatures level for decades or a century until such time as your emissions cuts uh, completed and your CO2 removal um, uh, kicked in. And so SAI would enable you to shave the peak off of that temperature hill. And that's the peak shaving analogy that is uh, the most common justification for SAI. So if we push the SAI launch button in 2050 and therefore have a sunshade over the globe by 2070, fine. That, that uh, would give us time between now and 2050 to improve the science about this. After all, there's a lot we don't know. Even more problematical is the governance of whose hand is on the global thermostat and how who makes those decisions and what participation do various groups have in those decisions. So there's, it's not bad news that launch is, is at least 20 years away because we've got more than 20 years of things we would need to do to justify a launch. So I can't imagine pushing the launch button any sooner than roughly 2050. And therefore, I've been in no hurry to try to push this technology on the world. If we're on the path that I expect we will be on, if the world needs this technology, they'll come find us. We've just got to have a tool ready so that if the world needs it, uh, we could respond. All of what I've described is the, 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 the current justification for SAI. And I'm about to take a step beyond the napkin diagram. In fact, that was my original title for this talk. Um, because recent scholarship is changing my perspective on the rationale that might provoke SAI and provoke it several decades earlier than what I've just described. And that rationale is tipping elements. Tipping elements are features in the global climate system that are bimodal they have two stable states, two or more. Um, you can apply an external forcing to that climate feature, and it will remain, uh, its response will remain linear until you reach some threshold, the tipping point, after which the climate feature may reorganize in a qualitatively very different way. And providing just a little bit of opposite forcing won't flip it back to the status quo ante. You've now changed it in a way that is very difficult to unchange. The classic analogy uh, uh, for tipping points is a leaning chair. You can lean back a little bit farther and the chair will remain upright. But there's some critical juncture beyond which if you lean back a little farther, the chair falls over, clatters to the ground. Um, and a minor amount of tipping of, of external forcing on the chair here won't turn it back upright. It has now qualitatively and fundamentally reorganized. There's a paper by David Armstrong McKay, University of Exeter in the UK, 2022, that presents a lovely fi figure of tipping elements. And you'll see that they are around the globe. They're all over the place. Any tipping of any one of these could have profound impacts on our climate. 
and rising temperatures is a plausible trigger for each of them. That's why they're on here. A key question in Armstrong McKay's paper is where the tipping thresholds are that would tip these things. How hot does it have to get before you reach some point of no return and your uh, uh, um, climate feature tips? An example is the uh, AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which is the current in the North Atlantic that brings a warm water from Florida to England and keeps Western Europe warmer than it would otherwise be given uh, its latitude. The uh, AMOC, as it's referred to, um, has a, an estimated tipping range in Armstrong McKay of AMOC is the fifth one down. There's a, a, a likely tipping threshold in the right-hand column of four degrees Celsius. That's where uh, uh, Armstrong McKay thinks the tipping threshold likely lies. Well, 4C, no problem. We ain't gonna get there in this century, so long as climate change remains linear to emissions. I'm not sure we'll ever get to 4C, so long as climate change remains linear to emissions. So if the temperature threshold that would tip the AMOC is 4C, we're okay. But it also might be as low as 1.4C. Well, holy cow, we're going to cross 1.4C in 2040. Everybody in this room is going to see that with their own eyes. The most frightening portrayal of tipping point catastrophes is presented by Ditlevsen and Ditlevsen 2023, sister and brother team in uh, Denmark, who estimate that there is a 95% likelihood that the AMOC will tip in this century. Tip means turn off, turn off the Gulf Stream. Over the following 30 years, the UK would get 10 degrees C cooler, 17 degrees F. That's a huge effing amount. 80% uh, of agriculture in the UK today would become unsustainable after that level of uh, cooling. So bizarrely, in a warming world, uh, Western Europe would cool dramatically. I have spoken with the Ditlevsons, charming people, uh, in January via Zoom and asked them what their um, uh, solution is to the prospect that they estimate that the AMOC might tip, turn off, in 2057. And their answer was, that's why we have to cut emissions so dramatically. Let me tell you, if your plan to avoid tipping point thresholds is cutting emissions, that's a very risky plan. I don't think that is realistic for any of these low tipping point thresholds. In fact, we may have already passed some of these. The fossil fuel energy system, uh, as people in the energy, ah, so the, here's the figure from Ditlevsen showing a AMOC tip in 2057. But the fossil fuel uh, element of the economy is approximately the biggest thing in the global economy. It's certainly one of the biggest things. It's sort of like these huge container ships. Uh, once they get going, they are difficult to steer and impossible to stop. And yet the diplomats negotiating at the Rio Earth Summit and the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, uh, um, all of which Joe is well familiar with, I imagine them standing in the ocean and commanding stop. That has been a very naive expectation. We have not stopped the fossil fuel economy. Um, and it's naive to think that we will stop it anytime soon. We're certainly steering it towards renewables, but we're not stopping the ship. We're not even slowing it yet. Emissions are still rising, despite the impressive progress of solar and wind and batteries and EVs, emissions are still rising. And it's emissions, aggregate emissions, not percentage of energy supply, 
it's aggregate emissions that inform the climate. So if emissions are still rising, we are not stopping this ship anytime soon. And now we're advised by Armstrong McKay, uh, by the Ditlevsons, by Tim Lenton also at Exeter, uh, that we are sailing into a domain of reefs that we can't yet see, but we might collide with at any juncture approximately. Our implicit plan on how to solve that problem is to stop the ship. I mean to talk everybody here out of that as being plan A. That's just an unrealistic plan A. If the minimum thresholds are near. Um, so in fact, our de facto plan is just hope that there are no reefs in our path for centuries, perhaps for the remainder of this, excuse me, for decades, perhaps the remainder of this century. And that's, again, a very risky plan. Now, perhaps there are no reefs, this uh, tipping element science is very immature. The, that's why the temperature ranges as to where we might encounter the tipping thresholds are so wide. Many modelers are not as spooked as I am about this, but when I press those same modelers as to why they're not spooked by this, their answer is, well, no, 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 no. I didn't say it's impossible. I don't think it's likely, but I can't rule it out. Well, if we can't rule it out, this is back to being terrifying. Um, so the punchline is, if we take tipping points seriously, I think we need an alternative plan. And fortunately, in respect of near-term tipping thresholds that we may or may not encounter in the middle of this century, there may be a better plan available via SAI. Again, not peak shaving SAI to manage global average surface temperatures all over the planet, but rather a polar solar geo program whose intent would be to keep at bay tipping elements at high latitudes. Now I'm choosing tipping elements just at high latitudes for a few reasons. One of them uh, is that that's where many, though not all, of the low minimum temperature threshold tipping elements lie. There is the AMOC to which I've earlier referred. Uh, again, global, excuse me, oceanic currents in the Atlantic Ocean move water both horizontally but also vertically, move uh, uh, a system by which surface water becomes bottom water and therefore oxygen flows into the deep ocean. And this is famously tippy, this has tipped 25 times in the last 110 years. So this is a very precarious uh, feature of the Earth system. And tipping is a perfectly reasonable possibility. But there's also the related but distinct subpolar gyre, a slightly different place in the Atlantic that is also a uh, vertical as well as horizontal current. Uh, permafrost could melt in a few different modes. There is gradual permafrost mode, melt, but there's also an abrupt permafro uh, permafrost collapse mode. The former is not tippy, it's linear, but this is tippy. Uh, if we trigger this, this could begin to run away with us. And unlike the ocean currents, which were nearly just move heat around the planet, this is runaway climate change. This would uh, add materially to the temperature projections we otherwise look at. And then there are the uh, ice sheets atop Greenland and Antarctica. These are in a middle category for me. They're meant to be super tippy. We may have already crossed, crossed the tipping thresholds, but the West Antarctic ice sheet, the Doomsday Glacier could add many meters to sea level rise may melt over 2,000 years. Well, 2,000 years ago, Christ was alive. Uh, that, that's a long time. Uh, the Greenland ice sheet is figured to melt over 10,000 years. I don't think those are going to be urgent calls to action. But tipping points with a low temperature threshold and a decadal rather than millennial tipping span, those are scary. 
There are also secondary targets that aren't tippy. There's no point of no return. They would respond linearly insofar as we know, but they're sure problems. Um, Arctic amplification is driven materially by disappearing summer sea ice. And uh, this too could be restored via a polar solar geoengineering program. And then the gradual permafrost melt mode that is already happening too could potentially be impacted. So there's substantial evidence, uh, uh, or at least support in the literature, that SAI could delay or prevent tipping. Although I want to note there's great uncertainty. The number of scientific field experiments that have been done in the stratosphere related to SAI stands at zero. This is a very immature technology. That's a problem. But we still haven't gotten out there and done the flying we would need to do to be confident that this would work. So let me characterize this as a promising hypothesis, but not uh, a proven remedy. Nonetheless, the other reason to focus on high latitude rather than global tipping elements is that in respect of high latitude tipping elements, we appear to have a tool that would be handy. This is a chart of the tropopause height. The tropopause is the boundary between the troposphere, the lowest layer of the atmosphere, and the stratosphere, the next layer up. And you'll see this is, this is the equator. So we're high in the middle and low near the poles. In order to, uh, if we deposit material in the troposphere, the lower layer, it will endure for uh, a matter of days and come down with the next rainstorm. But if we get it up into the stratosphere, it will endure for between six and 18 months, depending upon whether we put it near the equator or near the poles, but it will have a vastly longer endurance. And given that vastly longer endurance, it will be an effective radiative forcer. It will block a material amount of incoming sunlight. So to have an effective SAI program, we need to, to deploy in the stratosphere. Here's a little SAI uh, diagram that tries to compare uh, SAI to volcanoes. And this horizontal line in the middle of the screen is meant to be the tropopause. And this demonstrates that if you put the gunk in the stratosphere, as only the most powerful volcanoes do, but uh, Mount Pinatubo in 1991 in the Philippines is a last example of a volcano strong enough to punch all the way through to the stratosphere. But if you put the stuff in the stratosphere, then it lasts for quite a while. The problem is in the uh, tropics and subtropics where one would ideally deploy for a global program, um, the stratosphere is very high as I, uh, the tropopause, and therefore the lower boundary of the stratosphere, very high as I just showed. Existing planes can't get there. Um, uh, passenger planes can't, military tankers can't, fighter jets can't. Uh, the Global Hawk spy drone and a few other spy aircraft can get near the altitude that we need. But in the tropics, the height of that hump I showed you earlier is about 17 kilometers to stay safely above it because its height is in fact variable seasonally and daily and so on. We need to deploy at about 20 kilometers or roughly 66,000 feet. Again, that's roughly twice as high as your Airbus airliner will cruise. Um, this problem with the spy plane, it carries nothing. It even left its pilot on the ground. It only carries a camera. Whereas what we need for the purpose of SAI is a leaping aerial dump truck that can fly to a very high altitude, dump out a whole bunch of stuff, come back down and get another load. And that airplane does not exist yet. Although with a team of former Boeing engineers, we've designed uh, on paper um, uh, an SAI lofter plane that could do the trick, huge wings, six engines, teensy little fuselage because it's only carrying a dense load of chemicals. But there's no reason why we couldn't build this airplane. It's just no customer has wanted it yet. If we pivot, though, 
from the global SAI in the tropics at 20 kilometers, 66,000 feet, to which I was just referring, to instead the polar solar geo that we might do to arrest tipping elements in the high latitudes, the deployment altitude we require there is merely 13 clicks or 43,000 feet, roughly two thirds of the altitude that we required in the subtropics. At 13 kilometers, there are existing aircraft that can get there, which means we don't have to design a new airplane to undertake this program, which means we don't need two decades to develop the hardware, one decade would do. The 777 in particular is an aircraft that would uh, perform spectacularly in this polar solar mission. And that's a new conclusion of the paper that we've just submitted in respect of this. <laughs> But it's not the current 777. This shell can get there, but the interior isn't right for this mission. So we would need to design an aircraft mod uh, that would uh, install tanks in the aircraft, strengthen the floor to carry those tanks, um, uh, put the control systems in, uh, put um, uh, uh, life support uh, um, uh, systems in for the pilots because the material in the back is toxic. Uh, all sorts of mods that we would need, need to do, uh, modifications, uh, to an existing 777 in order to make it a 777 special tanker of the variety that we would need to do this. But we could do this. I've done this. Not literally this mod, but I've done other aircraft mods. It would take about three years to engineer uh, that mod program. And then another five, six, seven years to manufacture and subsequently modify a fleet of roughly 100 aircraft that would be necessary to carry out this mission. But still, uh, with $20 billion, with 100 aircraft, with a decade, we could have in place uh, a response capability for uh, tipping elements at high latitudes. Where we would deploy from would be 60 degrees north, roughly. That's Anchorage, Stockholm, as I've put stars on here, but Helsinki would do, Oslo would do in a different geopolitical universe, St. Petersburg would do. All of those are major airports at roughly 60 north latitude. Um, in each case, the airport would need to double its uh, uh, capacity to handle aircraft movements. So there's a big build out that would be needed. Um, but still, uh, uh, we could deploy from 60 north and cover the Arctic. In the south, there is nothing at 60 south. There is no land there anywhere in the globe. It's simply the Southern Ocean. So the Southern bases would need to be at the tip of Tierra del Fuego. Um, we would need to expand capacity there rather than 2x by 25x. These are teensy, weensy airports. But so essentially we would need to build two new airports, one in Chile, the other in Argentina. But from bases located in this way, we could um, uh, deploy uh, in a way that would be effective in the Arctic and the Antarctic. You could reasonably ask, what are we bothering with the Antarctic for? Most of our targets were in the Arctic. The problem is, uh, well, rather, uh, let me get to that in a moment. Uh, if we deployed rather at 60 north and 54 south, something called the Brewer-Dobson circulation, and if we get up into the stratosphere, then the Brewer-Dobson circulation would take our, the Brewer-Dobson circulation is a stratospheric wind circulation that carries from the equator to the poles. So if we put material at 60 north, it, most of it will go farther north to the North Pole, de descending there but that would put a parasol over the Arctic. And if we do a similar thing in the South, uh, the BDC would create a parasol over the Antarctic. So this in theory would be an effective um, uh, um, intervention. Again, back to the idea of why we need the South at all. The problem is there's a climactic equator, the intertropical uh, convergence zone that is where Northern and Hemisphere uh, southern hemisphere weather meet, the ITCZ informs the monsoons on which 
lots of humanity uh, depends. And if we deployed only in the north and not in the south, that would shift the IPCZ southward and change where it's desert and where it's very wet in ways that would be extremely disturbing. So any northern program would necessarily need an approximately equivalent southern program. And that's why uh, we would seek uh, bases in, in both uh, hemispheres. Um, deployments would only be in early spring and summer and endure uh, at these latitudes, the deployed material would last about six months. Um, so it would come down by autumn, but that's exactly when we need it there. There's lots of summer, excuse me, lots of sunlight in the Arctic in the summer and virtually none in the winter. So a seasonal deployment uh, is what we would see. We would also, um, be able to function with about a hundred aircraft as I earlier mentioned, but the same aircraft could deploy north and south because we're deploying in the north in March, April, May, June. They would then ferry into maintenance bases in the, in the mid latitudes, ferry south by September and deploy September through December in the south and ferry back into maintenance. Um, we can stop the screen share if we may. Um, so this is a much smaller program than a peak shaving program, but it's not one that can, can be done secretly. Uh, the fleet acquisition would cost roughly 20 billion. The airport build out expansions in the north, all new airplanes in the uh, ports in the south would cost another 15 ish billion. Those are simply upfront capital expenses. Thereafter, there will be operating expenses on the order of tens of billions of dollars. So only the largest economies in the world could afford to fund this. This isn't gonna be done by Bill Gates off of his private island in the Pacific or by some rogue terrorist group or some private actor. Uh, this is the domain of large governments. Um, and the consensus to proceed would be the hardest task. Um, but the physics and technology indicate that a polar solar geo program would be a viable defense against tipping elements at high latitudes. As I earlier mentioned, breaking the glass in an emergency only works if somebody had the forethought to install a uh, fire extinguisher in the, in the cabinet. That's what this would represent. Um, so in closing, I should list an almost inexhaustible list of caveats. Um, we still have a merely rudy, rudimentary understanding of tipping elements, and in particular, where the tipping thresholds lie. The whole climate domain is itself uncertain. We don't, in fact, know what RCP uh, the world will ultimately choose. We still only have a fuzzy idea of how sensitive the climate is to the greenhouse gas uh, burden that we're putting into it. And SAI, as I've mentioned, is utterly unproven. But if we take seriously what we do know about tipping elements, then I think it's very imprudent to tie our efforts to avoid tipping elements to the ghost ship of emissions trajectories. Nobody seems to be able to stop that ship. And so that shouldn't be our only defense. Rather, we should dramatically accelerate research not only into tipping elements, but into SAI as a defense against tipping elements at the poles. Colleagues here at Harvard have recently announced the termination of the Scopex experiment. And I was consulted in that decision and they, they made the right decision in my view. The uh, experiment had taken on baggage that was too heavy to carry. But directionally, we as a society, as a world, as a university, we need to do exactly the opposite. We need to get out in the stratosphere and start flying and figuring out whether this defense uh, would in fact be viable. Um, because I'm afraid we're sailing into a domain of reefs with no hand on the tiller and that can't be good. Thank you, Wake. So we have time for questions. I, I want to start with the first question before handing uh, the mic around the audience here. Uh, so I appreciate the presentation here. When you think about this sort of 
alternative of focusing on the Arctic regions right. with uh, a solar geoengineering intervention. Polar regions. The polar regions. Um, uh, be curious to understand what you think might be necessary in terms of the kinds of measurement and analysis to address what many critics have more generally of solar geoengineering, the concern about unintended consequences. How might we think, as we plan for this, what might be, I mean, this is the challenge, you're trying to imagine what you're not intending to do. What might be the unintended consequences of having this kind of regionally targeted approach to solar geoengineering? And what kind of system of monitoring and analysis do you think would be necessary to help us identify quickly when something unintended might be happening? So the answer is we don't have good answers to those questions, and I don't merely mean we don't know. When we do know, the answer won't be good. Th there may well be unintended consequences. I'm not standing in the way of that thought at all. That's why we need to start flying and need to start figuring things out. But we don't even need to wait for that. There are intended bad consequences, or at least known. Uh, the, 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 in order to reduce risk, the material we likely would start with is sulfur, the same material volcanoes put up there. The reason we would do that is we know that it works. After all, it, the, the northern hemisphere was a half a degree cooler for the year after Pinatubo and Krakatoa and Tambora. There's a long record of being clear that volcanic eruptions that put SO2 in the stratosphere cool that hemisphere materially. So we know it works physically. Um, uh, we also know that frogs in 1992, the year after Pinatubo, didn't have two heads. So there, we, we know uh, SO2 is already native to the stratosphere, so we're not putting something new there that's never been there before. So those things constrain the risks, but a program that put um, uh, lots of uh, sulfur in the stratosphere day after day is very year after year, decade after decade, that's different than a three or four day volcanic pulse. So it may have very different uh, impacts. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, denying that at all. The question in SAI world though, we'll only do this if we're worried and if things are going badly. If, if, if today's climate is what obtains, we would never do this. The, 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 the question then that arises vis-a-vis -vis SAI is not whether SAI is better than current climate. The question is, is SAI better than runaway climate change in the future? Well, I don't know, that's a much more dicey question. As regards monitoring, um, there would be all manner of monitoring that would be required. And the cost of that monitoring would roughly be equivalent to the cost of the direct deployment program. You wanna monitor the little suckers on the ground and make sure that the, the gunk they told you they were putting in the plane is what they actually put in the plane. You wanna monitor to make sure that um, people aren't doing it in, way, in, in, in manners that weren't approved, uh, that if you told them to put this much gunk in the sky today, they delivered that much gunk. You would want to monitor in the atmosphere in order to understand uh, whether it is evolving as you had expected it, it would evolve and it's flowing where you thought it would flow. The, um, uh, you would, uh, people would be terrified about this. And so there's all sorts of transparency, double, you know, and triple um, uh, 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 layers in order to ensure that the world could have faith that, that the, the uh, deployment apparatus was following instructions from some political apparatus. So monitoring is a, is a huge uh, element of this. What will be very difficult, and then I'll shut up, at least in respect to this question, uh, in this would be attribution science. So we start the SAI program and five years later, there's a drought in Brazil. Well, was it the SAI program? Everyone will say yes, but was it the underlying climate change? After all, the climate is still getting, you know, uh, changing in, in various ways, or is it some unrelated underlying third thing that had, you know, it would take um, quite a while to tease out the signal of what caused that drought in Brazil, and even then it would be contested. So um, there, there are uh, monitoring will be an issue, but attribution will be an even tougher one, I think. Let me open it up for questions from the audience. 
Thanks very much. Jennifer Spence, I'm with the Arctic Initiative here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And um, very, I really enjoyed in terms of your technical, the logic you're following for the technical, but I would tease out some of the sort of on the non-technical issues like you touched on in terms of governance. Um, and to me, uh, there's all the sort of unknowns and uncertainties around testing this type of technology, but also the million dollar question which you raised yourself, which is who is doing this exactly? And and some of the decisions around you, you said we would need to monitor and we would need to, as, as the we in this is incredibly, is, is sort of the million dollar question. And, and then the other piece I would add to this, and I'd love your thoughts is, is this sort of, you are, articulate very well that this is a, the, um, uh, thing for the extinguisher in the box, right. but that's your logic behind using it. And I would propose to you that there are many people would find that this would be a perfect uh, alternative to cutting back on some of those emissions and how you mitigate those kinds of political decisions and how by having a solution like this, it actually convinces people it's not necessary to cut those emissions and those sort of components of how people might use the existence of this type of technology as an alternative to some of the mitigation efforts that are needed. So th those are... Um, the classic issues that arise, there are 10 or 20 social scientists who write about those for every one person who's focused on this. So what I talk about is this, because it's the unique contribution I can make, but not with the intent of blowing past the much more important considerations that you're raising. Um, it isn't clear how we would assemble a governance structure that would legitimize such a thing. We're messing, even if we're just doing it at the polls, we're still affecting global uh, uh, climate. Um, and so how one acquires the, 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 the legitimacy to do that, I just don't know. I'm hoping other people here in the K school can, you know, that's not my department, but I'm, I'm being flippant. Um, it would be super difficult. I do wonder though, whether the tipping element justification for this, and I'm not pursuing this for the following reason, but I wonder if the, the following thing is nonetheless true, that the, the, the slow rise of temperature has not proven to be very motivating to the world. We're just not doing, we're not eating the vegetables they keep telling us we got to eat. I wonder if this would be perceived differently, and my analogy is the DART program by which um, uh, the U.S. NASA uh, sent uh, rockets into space to deflect an asteroid to see if we could deflect that asteroid on um, the theory that maybe in the, that, that asteroid wasn't a threat to the planet, but maybe in the future there would be one. And we need a fire extinguisher in that case, too. So that if somebody said, holy cow, there's an asteroid coming, we could respond. Um, and I, I uh, wonder if uh, the governance task will be easier if we really thought we confronted an AMOC shutdown or a, a catastrophic permafrost melt um, uh, uh, circumstance uh, in the near-ish future, whether the urgency of that, whether the more concrete threat might make the governance discussion easier, but I'm not exactly asserting that that is true. I just wonder. Um, certainly slowly warming temperatures, those have not made the governance discussion easy. Um, in terms of um, perverting the motivation for this, um, the moral hazard question, as it generally referred to, the idea that if people think there is a fire extinguisher in the case, they won't take seriously uh, or as seriously the need to cut emissions. I, I, I not only do I think somebody will use it th that way, I'm sure they'll use it that way. If I were Exxon's PR people, I'd fire me if I wasn't doing that. <laughs> this, of, that of course, that's what they will do. Does the fact that some people will mischaracterize this and seek to misuse it mean we shouldn't save the world from tipping point disasters if we could? No, I think it just means we've also got a whole communication effort that needs to be done as well to try to explain to people what this does and doesn't do. Again, something that may make that easier in this iteration is that this doesn't cool temperatures where people live, not very much. 
And so it isn't the same moral hazard opportunity. Don't worry about uh, your emissions. We can cool you if need be. This doesn't do that. Um, this does a different thing. Um, does that change the moral hazard equation? I don't know. So I guess I have two questions. One, the first one that's planning is I'm really curious to know what the uh, Danish pair said in response to your suggestion, why don't we just use uh, SRM instead, uh, solar radiation manager, or the, the yep, yep, yep. Air, 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 aerosol injection. Yep. Um, the second one on the moral hazard, actually, I think it goes the other way. You get this thing running and it's like the camel's nose under the tent or what have you. And uh, you demonstrate, if this demonstrates that it works, then certainly at this point, mid latitudes are going to be quite warm. There'll be a lot of deaths by heat waves, that sort of thing. So it'll actually increase the acceptance. It's like we're running the experiment here. Uh, and then presumably if it is a successful experiment, we learn from it, then we'll just be able to spread it. So I think it's not as easy just to, uh, and then that thing gets built. So I think it's not as easy just to dismiss the moral hazard part. I, I, I don't mean to be dismissing it. I, I, I'm assuring you that people will try to use it that way. I, I acknowledge that. But to take them in order, the Ditlevsen sort of said, huh, never thought of that. Um, uh, and more precisely, one of them was sort of open to it. And the other one said, eesh, I hate solar geoengineering. Don't tell me that's what you're thinking about this. So, that, But it, it hadn't occurred to them. It hadn't occurred to Armstrong McKay insofar as I'm aware, I'm the first one putting these two things together and saying this tool used in this way might be a remedy for that thing. Um, but I, insofar as I'm aware that this is a new framing. Um, the camel's nose, I bet it would work that way. That's true. Um, so does that mean we shouldn't save the world from an AMOC collapse? I still think if we, if we, if, if I thought that turning off emissions was a realistic prospect before we encounter any of these, I wouldn't be making this argument. But I'm afraid we, and, and again, it's probabilistic. It may be there are no reefs in, in our immediate future and that maybe there's one right ahead. But it seems irresponsible to me if we think we might have a tool that could defend us from colliding with a reef it seems to me irresponsible not to explore it, noting that it may have the moral hazard impact you're, you're, you're hypothesizing. I... Thanks very much. I, I, I learned an incredible amount. I, I have a- Then um... you misunderstood. <laughs> well, more than I, I previously do. My name's Rob Virchik. I'm a, a Radcliffe fellow. Um, my question has to do with governance as well. It, it, you, you posited two things to compare. One would be runaway climate change, and then the other would be uh, an SRM program where I assume we had some kind of proper global governance. But it seems to me that there's the most likely situation, which is the use of SRM and no uh, management, global management program, which means competing programs from various places. And I'm wondering if that's, maybe that's worse than everything. Could you comment a little bit about what the effects would be of more than one country or entity um, competing with different plans without any kind of coordination? I think that's governance dystopia, but it's perfectly plausible. It might even be the most likely thing. I, I, I don't... Um disagree with that either. I, I, you know, right now, with us trying to undermine Russia and them trying to undermine our elections, the idea that we would cooperate with that just seems impossible. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I still come back to if we're about to have a climate disaster, um, I think we have to try to find solutions to that. And I think we have to hope that we could find a way to govern it. I think it, 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 there is a theory of counter geoengineering. I'm not sure how plausible that is, but that would be super problematical. Um, if we're not talking about counter geoengineering, we're merely talking about uncoordinated cacophonous geoengineering. 
I don't think that's the end of the world. You, again, this can't be done seriously. The, the millions of tons a year aspect means we've got a big fleet. A hundred airplanes was for my dinky polar program. The global program is 800 airplanes or 600 airplanes and they're big airplanes. You're not doing that secretly. Earth, you know, cube sats that op do Earth observation would see that before the planes even took off. So you're not doing this secretly. If you're not coordinating with me and I'm wh whatever actor I am, I can at least monitor what the impact of your emissions are and what the impact of my emissions are and what the impact of their emissions are and try to counteract. Uh, uh, uh. For instance, if if somebody is venting only in the northern hemisphere and not in the southern, that would be from a global standpoint irresponsible. But other actors then could pick up the mantle and undertake the, the countervailing southern program. Um, and if somebody is only venting at 35 north because that's where their country is um, and that's not cooling things uh, uh, south of there in the northern hemisphere, other countries could pick up that mantle. But again, I don't mean to be sugarcoating it. All of this is the worst governance outcome. So my hope would be that we could find a better outcome, but I'm not, I'm not assuring you of that. Thank you very much. Um, a question on the more qualitative side. Do you think you could uh, give us a brief- on, on the what side? Qualitative side. Yep. Um, could you give us a brief summary of who the stakeholders are who are currently thinking about and um, really thinking about these solutions um, and their perspectives? You mentioned Boeing and kind of private sector actors. Um, it would be great to get a quick summary of who's looking at this from the different angles. Nobody but people in this room and people like the people in this room. It, 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 there is no real world traction on this at all. I would know. I'm the guy trying to convince Boeing and Airbus to spend time on it, and they don't want to listen to me. Um, uh, so there isn't the, the, the fear of the gentleman in the back of the room, I think, is a realistic fear. This, the idea that private, private enterprise, rather, will run away from this, I keep trying to fathom what the business model for that would be, and I can't come up with one. This is an unexcludable good. So there's no way for you and I to form a company and start doing this and charge people for it. Everyone will free ride. We have no way to toll them for that. Um, uh, I'm mentioning Boeing and Airbus as, as the parties that may build the aircraft, but they're only gonna do that with a $20 billion launch order from a government that's good for $20 billion. They're not gonna spec into this on their own. Um, I, I, I don't imagine this would likely be done by militaries. This, we're not flying in contested airspace. There's no mortal danger for our planes or our pilots. That, you know, it's, it's not a military application. It would probably, if it were done at all, it would likely be done by governments or coalitions of governments or the UN contracting with Boeing to build the aircraft and FedEx to fly the aircraft and um, you know BASF to make the chemicals. And I think you would do mediate this through the private sector, but, but no, no private sector. I, I haven't been able to imagine a private sector revenue model that would justify somebody trying to go into this other than, I don't know if you've heard of this goofy outfit, Make Sunsets, but they're, they're out there selling cooling credits um, I was contacted by NPR yesterday, urgently for a story today on Make Sunsets. How close are they to changing the climate? My math was they would need to grow by 20 billion times in order to, uh, you know, reduce global temperature by 0.1 C. They're just, it, it's a stunt, but it's a super effective stunt. NPR is calling me asking, you know, um, it, this, this, this is big and nobody, no philanthropist, no you know, private actor is going to do this on their own. This has got to be governments. Um, I, before, first of all, before I, I may ask my question, I would, uh, in your talks, particularly in audience on this, I wouldn't always use the word gunk. It doesn't make us feel really uh, confident about this. But I'm not trying to make you feel confident. <laughs> I, it, 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 it's a toxic chemical. Would toxic chemical be better? Uh, no, I would think something in between or something <laughs> different. But um, my question is, 
I've been to a lot of talks on this stuff for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, people talk about how this may be the only alternative we have because of that first slide, which said we're not going to come close. And if you do believe the scientists around the Paris Accord, we're not going to meet those. And therefore, we are going to uh, have to look at this. And yet, for the last 10 years, there's been a lot of resistance around the world uh, about this idea. Uh, so my question really comes, how are we going to change the public's reaction to this, particularly when I'm not convinced, and we've been doing a lot of talking about tipping points here in the last year, that there is a clear tipping point that's going to happen. Um, the only one we came up with that we think in the next 30 years could become uh, close to a tipping point is the Amazon rainforest. The rest of it, uh, either we don't have enough data to make any determination, or it just gets a little worse every five years in the situation. And in that type of uh, where we begin, we don't like it, it costs a lot of money, we, but we adjust. What is ever going to tip this idea into being accepted? If there's something that's currently visible, it's this very deck. It's tipping points, and I think tipping points in high latitudes. Uh, which the Amazon isn't, but that's a much more complicated thing. But you characterize it as a lot of money, you know, 35, 50 billion to put the fire extinguisher in the case. That's well, in a more when I write a paper about this, the theme of the paper is going to be risk management, not exactly. A, 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 a disaster that I know is going to come, but the consequences of an abrupt permafrost melt trigger or an AMOC shutdown are so disastrous that I imagine it will be in the world's interest to have tested solutions beforehand and have the infrastructure for solutions beforehand, even if the disaster never comes. It's a form of insurance that I think it's imprudent not to, at minimum, seriously explore. How do you convince the public? Uh, I'm going to give you a bad answer, but it's my answer. Um, I'm just going to sit here and try to build a tool. And if the public doesn't want it, then it means it didn't go the way I thought it would and good on them. And if the public needs it, they'll come find me. Thanks. I just want to sort of circle back to Joe's initial comment, which links to what Henry is saying, which is part of the, the I think, the concern that ultimately comes into play is the side effects that we can't anticipate and the risks associated with it that we don't, um, you know, there, we do have a history as humans of being somewhat arrogant about what we think we can and can't do and having the ripple effects of that be quite disastrous. And when you start to get at this scale, presumably those side effects can be uh, significant. So maybe you could talk a little bit about in terms of if you have to do this at scale in order to see the the true uh, benefits or impacts that it has the potential to have, how do you test something like this in a way to give people the comfort that it can, it, that it isn't sort of the next invasive species type of phenomenon, which would, you know, presumably then be able to provide a different narrative. How do you test this? Is it possible to test this in in ways that really could give that sense that we actually know what we're doing, and it's it that the uh, decision to break the glass will not ultimately, you know, blow up something else? The the honest answer is only sorta. Um, there are lots of process tests that we can do to what Scopex was. You go up, blow some stuff out the back of a balloon gondola, you fly back up the plume and figure out the microphysical evolution of the particles at you know, 10 minutes after venting and nine minutes and eight minutes and so on. And so th there's all manner of, of experiments that we can do to understand uh, the, the uh, again, evolutionary path of the aerosols and the physical path of the aerosols. The particle sizes is a big unknown and a surprisingly substantial uh, element of how well this works. There are all sorts of things like that that we can do. But what will the climate response be? It's hard to have full faith in that before we in fact go forward. 
another element of this program that might make it more palatable is it is a way smaller uh, program uh, over parts of the earth that literally no one lives in in the south and very few people live in in the north. And so if there are material risks to agriculture or people breathing this stuff or whatever, this would be a relatively isolated experiment that would minimize those risks. But again, if we're, I, I continue to think of this in a risk-risk framing. So what you would, the, 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 if there were no risk from runaway climate change, we wouldn't do this. The question is, is the, are, might the unintended co consequences that derive from this be more scary or less scary than the consequences of runaway climate change without this? And again, I think that's a much more nuanced option, but this won't be a risk-free option. Uh, so let me ask one last question before we wrap up, uh, which gets to this issue about how we think about governance. Um, and wondering if you've thought anything about what might be an existing institution, whether it's the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, maybe it is the G8 or G20 or G7, maybe it is the International Civil Aviation uh, Organization. Is there anything when you think about this where you're like, here's where you would get the relevant decision makers from government, governments together? Because you've emphasized this would be a government run, administered uh, a kind of program. Is there any existing institution? Or for those of us who think about governance, we need to be creative about an alternative doesn't exist today institution that would be fit to the purpose of managing such a program. Or something like the UNEP or the IPCC for that matter to undertake this would be a material change in their mission. And I'm not clear that they would be authorized to do that. So it's easier for me to imagine that it is some new thing that may start with the club of countries that could conceivably do this. It's a little bit like thinking about nuclear weapons limitations. Every person in the world wants to have their faces pressed against the glass looking in the room, but for the treaty to be effective at constraining capable actors, people in the room have to be the capable actors. And that's where it's got to start but the entire rest of the world will demand entry into that room. And ultimately, that's proper, the all affected principle, it will affect everybody. But I think it would start with the, the capable actors sitting down and figuring out what governance they're willing to submit to. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, creating institutions around that that bring in everybody. But, but it, it won't merely be nations. Every labor union and every indigenous um, you know, uh, people and uh, it, it, it's, it's a global, it's ultimately a global decision. But again, I'm describing, per, per your comment, I'm now describing fantasy land on Christmas morning in terms of how governance, you know, it would be very hard to put that together. So. Great. So uh, before we wrap up, let me know we'll meet again next Monday here in Rubenstein 414A at noon. Uh, Roxana Shafi will give a talk on the cost of producing hydrogen. And please join me in thanking Wake Smith for his presentation today. Thank you, Wake. That was great. <laughs>